Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good morning to those of you in the West Coast. Welcome to our program today entitled Federal and State Regulators and Watchdog Groups are Bearing Down on Charities and Their Professional Fundraisers, How to Prepare for the Regulatory Storm. My name is Jeff Tenenbaum, Chair of the Nonprofit Organizations Practice here at the Venable Law Firm. Uh, welcome to those of you uh, in our DC office today who joined us for lunch and the I think close to maybe 250 or 300 of you on the telephone across the country who have dialed in for the webinar portion of today's program. As many of you know, this is part of the monthly series that we've been doing for over six years uh, at Venable's uh, DC office uh, focusing on a wide variety of different nonprofit legal and regulatory and quasi-legal issues uh, each month. These programs are recorded and they're all available uh, if you're interested on our nonprofit YouTube channel. A uh, link to that is on the last slide of today's uh, PowerPoint presentation. Uh, before we get into uh, the topic a bit and our speakers, a few housekeeping tips. Uh, for those of you in the trade and professional association community, I know there are a number of folks participating in today's program who, uh, who run or are connected with related foundations of trade and professional associations. These programs are eligible for CAE credit. Um, we have only one formal uh, upcoming program to announce. Uh, next month, December 12th, the program which is going to be co-sponsored with the BDO firm is entitled Top 10 Risks Facing Nonprofits Operating Internationally. It's going to be a terrific program for any of your organizations, uh, which is an ever-increasing number of uh, U.S.-based nonprofits that either are operating overseas or plan to at some point. It's going to be a terrific program. I strongly encourage you to attend. And we have, uh, we're in the process of uh, finalizing the details for our January, February, and March programs for early next year, and we'll have those nailed down and announced very shortly. Some of you may know Venable will be moving offices in February right up the street about uh, just a few blocks, beautiful new offices. So we'll be, we will be here for January and February, and then after that we'll be in the new building for March. So I hope you can join us for programs starting in March next year in our new offices. Uh, in terms of Handout materials. Those of you in the room have a spiral bound printed book that has a copy of the slides from today's uh, PowerPoint presentation along with bi full uh, speaker bios and some really valuable handout materials. Some really good stuff there that I encourage you to take a look at. Uh, those of you on the webinar received the link to the PowerPoint as part of the confirmation email you received this morning. <clears throat> All of you tomorrow will receive an email that contains a link to the recording of today's program. Feel free to share that with colleagues and others who might benefit from it, uh, along with all of the full um, PowerPoint and handout materials and speaker bios. In terms of questions, those of you in the room, uh, we encourage you to ask questions throughout the program. The only thing I ask is that you raise your hand and wait for the microphone to come to you so that everyone on the webinar can hear your questions. Those of you on the webinar, pose your questions to me using the chat feature on the webinar software, and I will pose those to our speakers at the appropriate times. Now, as to our speakers, uh, um, as, as many of you know, sometimes we bring in a number of folks uh, from outside of Venable to join our panels, like the one for next month. Uh, uh, sometimes, though, we have all Venable lawyers, as we do today and on this program, and you're in for a real treat with uh, three of the real stars of our nonprofit practice. Um, to my immediate right is Anita Drummond. And by the way, I'm just going to uh, touch on a highlight or two from each of their bios, but I would encourage you to read more about them in, in the handout materials. Uh, Anita is the newest member of our team, has been with us for a few months. Uh, prior to that, though, we had the uh, privilege of working closely with Anita when she worked for 10 years at the Nature Conservancy um, in, a, in a client capacity for us. Uh, so we got to know her very well. In fact, even prior to that, she worked at Associated Builders and Contractors, a trade association where we worked with her as well. Uh, she's a, a terrific nonprofit lawyer, uh, does a little bit of everything, and, and certainly has a deep experience in the issues that we're going to be talking about here today. Um, to Anita's right is Eric Berman. Um, Eric, I think, is technically not part of our core nonprofit group, but we certainly consider him very much an honorary member. It seems like more so every day. Uh, Eric uh, primarily focuses uh, his practice in the area of uh, consumer protection and antitrust, uh, Federal Trade Commission, Department of Justice, State Attorneys General. Uh, he's involved frequently in litigation in this area, including one case <clears throat> he's going to be talking about here today. And he works very closely with many of our nonprofit clients in this regard and has a, a terrific uh, perspective to, uh, to bring to today's program. And finally, to Eric's right is Aditi Iraq. Uh, 
Uh, Atitia is an associate in our nonprofit organization's practice. Has been with us for <clears throat> how long? Uh, eight, almost two years. Wow. Uh, she's become a very quickly a huge rising star in a, in our practice. Uh, very beloved by many of our clients who work with her, and also not surprisingly, has done a lot of work in this area. Prior to that, she came to us from Legal Services Corp Corporation, where she worked for several years in an in in-house capacity, and has a terrific vantage point from that experience as well. So without any further ado, let's turn it over to Anita to get us started. Anita? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and congratulations. I believe you're attending the session with the longest title of the year. <laughs> so uh, we could call this, uh, Let's uh, Make You World Series Winners in Fundraising Compliance. Um, as uh, as Jeff mentioned, uh, Eric's role is more of a designated hitter, so we're going to talk about players today. Uh, we're going we're gonna to talk about uh, the fact that uh, you need to know all the players that are involved in fundraising compliance. We're going to talk about the trends, and I think that's where a lot of people are probably enticed to come, especially enforcement area. Uh, legal compliance, just some nuts and bolts, making sure that you know what to check off the box. There's a very good handout that has more details, but we'll cover it also in the slides and some risk management tools, basically how to get started on that. So in this scenario, I'm suspecting you guys all want to get a hit, um, and you want to know as one to nine, you've got nine defenders, who all you need to think about. So we really do want you to come through like the Chicago Cubs and win the whole thing. So here we go. The picture I think of is IRS. You know why? Because that is the player that gets the most face time. But let's face it, you guys have a really good batting average. You've got to worry about everybody else. But I do want to point out in particular on the Internal Revenue Service, in many ways it's giving your organization exposure to all the other parties that are interested in your enforcement. Um, your 990 obviously has a lot of disclosures about your governance, your conflicts procedures, those things become incredibly interesting to attorney generals. So having a real high level and thorough look at what you are telling the public in that, uh, in that form is critical. A lot of people overlook the fundraising aspects of it, and I will f just point out that in fundraising there are many key questions that uh, the IRS had in its audit procedures. You'll see of parallels in the states. So who's the catcher? That's the state charity regulators. Those are the people that day to day are looking at your, um, your, your applications for registration, your annual reports. But they're also very interested in the parties with whom you contract, um, professional fundraising, fundraising councils. They're spending a whole lot of time on that. Um, commercial co-ventures. Many times a commercial co-venture that's sophisticated will do a filing in a state where you're not registered, um, and there may be a reason for that, but that can get you crossways. All of that is to say that those catchers are ways to catch you doing, uh, having reporting that's inconsistent. But as we all know, some of the most common ways out is the state attorney generals, and I consider them the first basemen. I mean, they really are the people that want to get the out. So, um, understand that whether the Attorney General's Office is your regulator or not, Attorney General's Offices consider it a very serious duty of theirs to, uh, to protect the public trust in charitable funds. So it is important that you realize how, um, how active they are becoming, and we're going to talk about that. Lots of people miss those third basemen, I'm telling you. The third baseman can come in and they, um, they're interested. You may have an agency that's specially dedicated to consumer protection. They may have a special uh, statutes about telemarketing in their state, uh, tax issues. Um, it, you may think, well, we're tax exempt. What are their tax issues? Um, the Franchise Tax Board in California, by example, completely never talks to the California state charity regulators, and you do have to do an annual filing with them, and a lot of people miss that. And the question comes, is now your income taxable in the state of California, not the state you want to pay state tax? Um, insurance commissions, charitable gift annuities, insurance commissions, not in every state, but one regulator or another is regulating that. So if you do charitable gift annuities. Now Eric made me put um, public utilities on here, and, 
Eric, you don't have a reason for that, do you? <laughs> I feel like I'm being set up here. Um, I, I, yeah, I know the PUC seems maybe out of place for a, a discussion like this. Um, it really falls under the above bullet enforcement focus on telemarketers. If you're a charity and you're using a national fundraiser and that national fundraiser uh, you know, calls donors using an auto dialer or what state regulators would call, I'm sorry, my voice is usually booming. I'm never accused of being too uh, too soft. Um, you know, uh, automatic dialing and announcing devices, ADADs. There are some states, not most, that require the caller to register with with the telephone service, the Public Utility Commission, or the Public Service Commission. In some states, uh, there's a carve out for our sector, um, and and it only applies to commercial calls. But in other states, it's it's all ADAD. So. Just wanted to put that up there as an issue spot. So those kinds of third basements can sometimes people don't even pay attention to the second basement. And let's face it, the, the photo always goes to the first basement taking the catch. But here's the thing, second basement I find uh, you got to look for in your loca local uh, jurisdictions. Um, event licenses for fundraising, canvassing for fundraising, there are all types of small uh, jurisdictional issues and you want to be aware that there may be a regulator there. Now the infield always gets the best photos, but let's face it, the outfield gets the big out. So Eric, what do you think about the outfield? Well, it, let's talk about the Federal Trade Commission for a second. It's a very important player. Uh, and by the way, can folks hear me now? Okay, thanks. Um, very important player in this space in no small part because a lot of people in the nonprofit sector think that the FTC can't touch them. And that's not quite true, and it can be dangerous uh, to, to operate that way. Put aside the fact that the FTC clearly has jurisdiction over your C6 uh, trade and professional associations. That's not controversial, and you know, there's been a lot of antitrust enforcement in that space. But even C3s, it's not that the FTC can't go after a C3. It's more precise to say, that the FTC only has jurisdiction over corporations um, that are you know, in, in business for their own profit or that of their members. So they typically stay away from charities. But if the FTC has reason to believe that the charity is not functioning properly, that the charity is in business for the benefit of its own members, its employees, officers, directors, or its for-profit fundraiser, the FTC is going to try to pierce that corporate veil and, and go after the charity. Since 1990, I think there's been seven FTC enforcement actions, most of them not public, uh, against charities. That that's, doesn't sound like a lot, but it's a lot you know, for an agency that allegedly doesn't have jurisdiction over, over the space. Um, and, and so, you know, and, and a lot of resources here to bring to bear. Um, and so definitely wanted to, to, to raise that. Um, should I talk about media for a second? Um, you know, there are certain players in the media, and I'm thinking of the Tampa Bay Times, I'm thinking of the Center for Investigative Reporting, um, I'm thinking of David Farenholt uh, of the Washington Post who meticulously tracked um, Donald Trump's uh, charitable giving. Um, and you should all be heartened to know that you can blatantly violate New York uh, charity solicitation laws and still become president one day. So, you know, uh, the American, <laughs> the American <laughs> Well, we, we can on. resist that one. <laughs> <laughs> Only controversial to uh, comment for today. Um, but but there, there are members of the media who really focus heavily on, on the charity space and, and have sort of brought it to the fore. Um, so another member of the outfield along with the FTC, I think. And I think maybe an important, and you're going to hear this theme throughout today's program, is that don't get too caught up on the jurisdictional issues. Yes, the FTC does not have jurisdiction in most areas over a bona fide nonprofit or, or bona fide 501c3 organizations. It does have jurisdiction, like Eric said, over trade and professional associations. But the FTC certainly does have jurisdiction over many for-profit vendors, professional fundraisers. Um, others, uh, uh, commercial co-ventures, and others who may be doing things to help a charity raise funds or raise awareness. Um, in addition, the FTC, and we're going to talk about this a lot, state attorneys general, the IRS, and many other regulators talk all of the time now more than ever before. So even if one of these agencies doesn't have jurisdiction over your nonprofit organization, 
Most of the others probably do. Um, and there's constant communication amongst and between them. And then as Anita is going to talk about here, as you see charitable watchdog and rating groups, the media, all of this stuff is intertwined. And we hear all of the time from the IRS, from State Attorney General, from the FTC, that oftentimes investigations are started and inquiries are made because of what they read in the media. It happens all the time. It's just the way that, that the world works. And so don't think, that be, don't think, oh, I can block out the FTC stuff because it's really not relevant to my charity. That's definitely not the case. And the outfield is full. I would say it has far more than three players, so you're really stacked against you. Um, in addition to the media, the whistleblower has become a growing area, um, and that whistleblower is looking for the attention at me at, in the media in particular. But the charity uh, rating and watchdog agencies, which we're going to talk about a little bit more in detail on trends, um, they are getting more sophisticated, and they're getting more traction because they're doing the work of really uh, highlighting you know, the top 10 fundraising contractors to avoid, the top charities that are over uh, paying their fundraisers. And they have lists like that everywhere. So it's an easy place for, um, for regulators to go. So don't ignore those third parties. Okay, we're going to talk about three areas of trends, enforcement collaboration, which is the trend, which Jeff already alluded to. We're going to talk about the data and the data mining that's out there, and then we're going to talk just briefly about some legal trends. Great, thanks. So yeah, I'll talk, I'll talk a bit about trends now, and, and it's a timely topic of discussion. We're sitting here in mid-November, and uh, we tend to see, if you're just looking calendar, you know, within the calendar year, you tend to see an uptick in enforcement uh, or at the very least uh, consumer advisories, donor alerts, things like that in the fourth quarter of the calendar year. You can understand why, right? You're in October, it's Breast Cancer Awareness Month. There's a massive amount of so-called pink marketing going on and the media has caught wind of it and regulators have caught wind of it. And you know, just want donors to understand that if you're buying a pink ribbon or a pink sweater, is it going to a breast cancer charity? Is it going to an affiliated retail or a for-profit? Um, you know, just, just to be aware of that. Uh, October is also when the annual uh, NASCO meeting occurs, uh, National Association of State Charity Officials, and that happened, what, just three weeks ago? Um, and Atiti and, uh, and I were there. Uh, it's really the only time during the year when the, the federal regulators uh, from the FTC uh, and, and the state charity officials all get together in one room and it's a three-day conference and two of the three days are, are not open to the public. So certainly there is uh, an exchange of information going on uh, away from our eyes and ears. November, you've got Veterans Day. Veterans Day is tomorrow actually. Um, and, and, and veterans is a demographic just like the elderly that a lot of charity regulators uh, are seeking to protect. And then next month you have the end of year winter holidays and you know, donors trying to get that last tax deductible donation in before the end of the year. So you, you really see a, an uptick in, in the fourth quarter. Oh, I'm a clicking neophyte, I'm sorry. And, uh, you know, looking over, you know, year over year, as, as both Jeff and Anita have already said, the trend is clearly one of increased enforcement, um, increased levels of collaboration and cooperation nationwide among the states and among the federal regulators uh, and the states. And, you know, some states are more aggressive than others. California, New York, Minnesota come to mind, but others that you may not think about, Pennsylvania, um, and, and fundraising abuse is by far the number one area of enforcement in the charity space. Uh, more than 60% of the enforcement actions that have been reported over the past few years involve uh, fundraising abuse. And in fact, um, some of the uh, media attention that, that arose out of the Trump Foundation um, certainly caused, for instance, the New York Attorney General's Office Charities Bureau to announce that they were opening an investigation um, into the uh, Trump Foundation. Uh, we even got some outreach from some other state AG's offices that don't have kind of thriving charity offices to say we really need to get with the, the bandwagon here and, and, and start develop, you know, uh, what kind of things should we be looking at? Uh, because, you know, frankly, for 
uh, state AG's offices, which are very political, of course. Um, you know, this is sometimes low-hanging fruit and things that, that most everyone can get behind. You know, if they're in. Clearly, some of the stuff we're going to talk about, like the case that we're going to talk about right here, um, you know, maybe organizations, charities, quasi-charities that are really pushing the envelope. But other times, um, it, it's not always what you might think of as the bad actors, and that's maybe another theme that we're going to try to stress to you today. But this applies to all of you, and we see it all of the time. Now, your organization might not end up on the front page of the Washington Post and the New York Times like the Trump Foundation did, but you will have regulators pursuing you when you, when you make mistakes, when you, when you trip up in these areas. And as you're going to see as we get into the meat of this today, there are many, many different areas that you can trip up. So don't listen to Eric's case study here and think, well, we're, we're not in that category. No, we're we're, we're, uh, we're in, on the other end of the spectrum. Uh, this applies to all of you. Do you have a question right here? Derek, just hold on one sec for the uh, microphone. Do you, have, is there, do you have any kind of uh, a general sense of how much of enforcement uh, would be traps for the unwary and mistakes as opposed to how much of it is really going after bad actors, folks, where there's a suspicion of intent. Yeah, well, that's a great question. That's really the point I was making. It's a, it's a combination of both. And there are many, many, many traps for the unwary. Now, if you fall into one of those traps, is it likely going to get your organization shut down? No. Um, but is it likely going to have uh, perhaps some fines assessed against your organization, perhaps some bad press? Perhaps showing up, uh, we alluded earlier to these charity watchdog groups. Uh, you, you get any kind of publicly available negative information against you and it shows up generally. They're very aggressive in, in trying to capture that information and warn donors and potential donors and potential grantors about that. It can have very serious effects. Even for a really well-run, well-meaning organization that just happen, happens to fall in one of those unwary traps. But part of today's program is to help you figure out what those traps are and, and how to avoid them. I think, I think Jeff has it exactly right. And I, and my, my personal experience is that a lot of regulators aren't out to play gotcha with a well-meaning but technically non-compliant organization. Um, at the same time, uh, whereas the FTC is a regulator that I, I, I tend to think of as an example of good government. They don't sort of shoot first and aim second. They have workshops, they have rule makings, and they, they try to work with industry to get the right answer. A lot of state AGs sue first. Um, and actually, TT and I talked with uh, a regulator from the Kentucky AG's office who admitted to us that uh, the, the AGs don't do as good of a job of working with industry as they could be. And I think they're, I think they're looking to improve on that. And you know, other examples we saw even in this campaign, um, you know, the, uh, David Fahrenholt from the Washington Post and others reported on some seemingly pretty blatant violations by the Trump Foundation. But there was also plenty of, of reporting about some clear legal and regulatory missteps by the Clinton Foundation, without question. Um, you know, were they? Uh, these are not seemingly uh, intentional uh, attempts to, uh, to, to circumvent the law. I mean, people, people can argue about that. Um, but regardless, the point is that even the most seemingly professionally well-run, well-staffed, you know, top-rate, top high-priced outside advisors, and we saw quite a number of uh, uh, potential or alleged missteps in that area as well. It can happen to any organization. So uh, around this time last year, Jeff and I did a panel, and we were we were uh, honored to have a regulator from the New York Charities Bureau with us. And we we mentioned this case, this FTC and multi-state case against the the Cancer Fund of America. At the time, the case was ongoing. Uh, this past spring, the remaining defendants settled, and so the case is effectively over. There's some there's some lingering uh, you know bankruptcy uh, stuff going on. But you know this this is sort of the case study where, as Jeff uh, aptly said, you're not you're not this bad. <laughs> you may not even closely resemble what was going on here. Your fundraisers may not, but it is a cautionary tale for everybody. The FTC is very proud of the work that it did here. The states are very proud of the work that they did here. And we talked a few minutes ago about seeing an uptick in enforcement toward the end of the year. You know how this case started when the states started sending CIDs and subpoenas to the various uh, charities uh, December 22nd of 2010, three days before Christmas, and they were off to the races. 
um, and after getting some document productions and credit card receipts, American Express statements said, wow, a lot of, a lot of these donations are going to Disney cruises and Vegas uh, weekends. Maybe, maybe <laughs> there's, there's some private uh, inurement here uh, and, and some misuse of, of funds, and, and we can get the FTC involved. And the FTC got involved in 2010. Um, and uh, you know, this, this was a case involving three 501c3s plus a 509 supporting organization and their principals. And the allegations uh, were that you know, the, the charities were being run for the benefit of, of the families that, that created them. There were a series of charities. Um, uh, excessive executive compensation, poor accounting practices, and misleading donors about where their donations went. And, and you know, those are three no-nos that we'll talk about in, in another minute or two. Um, but this is sort of like patient zero for this new era of federal and state cooperation. And I, and I heard uh, from the FTC lawyer who, who has been running the FTC's charity and fundraising cases for 27 years at NASCO, uh, she said, always assume that we're talking to the states at this point. Jeff had it exactly right. This stuff is all intertwined and they talk all the time. So what, what practices are uh, regulators going after in, in particular? And, and none of this should really come as a surprise. Using fake names and, and, or, or failing to make uh, proper disclosures. Every single state that regulates charitable solicitations wants a disclosure, a clear and conspicuous disclosure to the donor. Um, who they're talking to, are they talking to a paid fundraiser, the name of the fundraiser, um, you know, no, no conflating of identities here. Um, changing names of charities to sound like other similar charities. Uh, you know, Make-A-Wish Foundation is a very well-known, well-regarded charity. Uh, Kids Wish Network. Does anybody here from Kids Wish Network? Good. Terrible charity. And, 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 and you know, according to the Tampa Bay Times, is the single worst charity in the country. But um, that actually was an issue with the Reynolds family and Cancer Fund of America. Jim Reynolds Sr. used to work for the American Cancer Society and was sort of unceremoniously dumped from it in the 1980s, and he started Cancer Fund of America. And he initially used a P.O. box that was very similar to the one that ACS uh, used. Um, and you know, <laughs> that, that, that wasn't by accident. And, and that type of behavior, um, I know sounds like it's common sense to everybody in this room, but you'd be surprised at, at people who think that they're clever and, and they're not. Um, misrepresenting what the charity does, how the money will be used, an obvious no-no. Um, filing false or I think more commonly incomplete registration and uh, financial reports with the state. Um, that, that's kind of the gotcha that I, was, that, that I was talking about. You're more likely to get a letter and, hey, could you please supplement this? Um, if you hire a TTA, you won't have to worry about that. Um, but you know those those are those are enforcement trends that that the regulators are looking at. Just to add to uh, Eric's right. um, comment, real quick, sorry. Just to add real quick to uh, Eric's comment about filing incomplete registrations. You know, regulators will work with you um, to make sure that you're providing all the information they're looking for. Um, but by you know providing false information or just not completing the registrations in full, that's just opening the door for them to look closer into your organization. Um, and believe it or not, even though um, the state regulators, you know, they have limited resources, but they are looking at these filings to make sure that um, you're making the proper disclosures and reporting um, complete information. Um, maybe I might add one more, uh, and we can add a number more of uh, kind of hot topics to areas that, that, that regulators are looking at with respect to charities and, and um, related activity. But the um, issue that Eric alluded to uh, in, the, in the cancer fund case of uh, related party transactions, this is something that we've certainly seen cases, multiple cases, back, I don't know, seven, eight years ago, the IRS had a huge enforcement initiative going on involving nonprofit credit counseling agencies. Congress also got very much involved in that. One of the hallmarks of those cases was the, were these related party transactions where the people that ran the nonprofits 
owned companies that were providing services to the for-profits and they were benefiting from those. And in a lot of those cases, there was some very serious abuse. In some other cases, there, were, there was lesser abuse. It, it, it created huge problems under the federal tax code, things called private inurement and private benefit. But it also got the attention of a lot of state uh, charity regulators who also brought a number of actions against those. And one thing that we've seen is that while those are kind of the outliers, and Eric's cancer case may be an outlier in terms of the really bad actors, we see related party transactions all of the time, and they're not all bad, but they do have a ten they, they they do have the potential for abuse. And so there are certain key steps that you need to go through to be sure that you know if you happen to be hiring your brother-in-law to provide some services, or you happen to be hiring a company in which your wife has some ownership stake in, or things like that, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad deal for the charity or that it's illegal. But if you don't go through, go through certain certain steps to help protect the organization to make sure that independent decision makers are making that decision, that there's proper vetting, analysis of all available options, that you're looking at the comparability of fees being paid, make sure they're at fair market value, and other things like that, then you can get yourself into big trouble. And this is another area that regulators still remain very much focused on. Absolutely right. And, and regulators uh, you know, engage in public outreach and education as well. And, and as, as Anita said, you know, kind of view themselves as guardians of the public trust, of charitable assets, of donors' intent. Um, slightly more than half of the state AGs that regulate the sector have hotlines where donors can call in and lodge complaints. Um, that's true of the Federal Trade Commission as well, by the way. The FTC has a consumer sentinel, um, which, which is you know, uh, a, a great resource uh, and, and a way that it builds cases. Um, about a third of the states issue annual reports. Uh, sometimes these aren't uh, dispassionate, objective reports. New York's annual report is called Pennies for Charity. There's a clear message there uh, and kind of a warning sign to donors. Um, but those are some, uh, certainly not an exhaustive list of, of what the states are doing in terms of public outreach. The IRS has a hotline as well. Oh, very good. Um, I'm just, just in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over this slide. But the, the, I think, I think, I think, suffice it to say, uh, enforcement against non-compliant fundraisers is very real. Has resulted in significant uh, financial penalties, significant um, injunctive penalties, uh, and there's there's some non-public ones that we're aware of as well that are in the pipeline. Uh, this stuff is ongoing. I did want to spend uh, maybe a minute on, on this slide. You know, those of us uh, sitting at the table uh, who are regulatory lawyers, you know, we, we, tr we try our best to counsel our clients, and it, it's, it's not always enough to look at what the statute says. The statute can be very vague and broad, and what does it mean? And looking at settlements that organizations reach with, with, with regulators, and, and the slide says state AGs, but it applies with equal force to the FTC, I'm sure the IRS, uh, really telling. And yes, there's always that language that says nobody admits guilt and nobody admits the facts. Um, but still, you have a roadmap of what regulators are telling you they think uh, is compliant behavior. And there's been some, some noteworthy stipulated judgments um, assurances of discontinuance, consent decrees, all sorts of settlements with fundraisers and with charities. And, and you know, here's sort of a laundry list, and, there's, and we could add to this, of, of, of you know, what regulators want to see. Truthful language. Basic truth in advertising concepts apply when you're fundraising for a charity. There's no exemption uh, for, for the charitable sector here, and the FTC uh, and the states would expect you to verify the claims that you're making in scripts, in written materials, in brochures. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them. But and, and by the way, truthful does not just mean that you're telling a lie. I mean, it, it, maybe in some cases it may be that way, but uh, it, it's far more nuanced than that. And what regulators are looking for is not just the truth, but full, dis full and complete and comprehensive disclosure. Sometimes if you say one thing but you fail to say something else, a regulator may consider that to be deceptive or misleading, and all of this kind of falls within the realm of potentially illegal um, uh, fundraising, solicitation language, or other marketing language or things like that. Um, it, there's a reason we put that bullet point at the top because it's such a huge, broad, important point. Uh, if you're making claims that you're, you're claiming something about the success of your organization or 
impact of your fundraising dollars and how they've been spent or whatever else the, the case may be, you need to be able to substantiate those claims and you want to have great uh, written substantiation. You want to keep good records of that. Eric, it's probably worth uh, walking through a few of these because I, I do think this is really important. I always believe that when we see these uh, stipulated settlements, um, they're always rich with these are lessons and it's really a roadmap for other um, nonprofit organizations to follow in terms of best practices, kind of behavior you want to engage in, the kind of behavior, behavior that you don't. Uh, absolutely happy to. Uh, you know, control of the solicitation messaging and brand by the charity. The, the, the charity should control this. The charity should own the donor list. I've seen contracts where the donor list is co-owned or the fundraiser outright owns the donor list. Regulators view the donor list as uh, the intellectual property of the charity. And a, a, a well-functioning charity, um, and I shouldn't, uh, well, the best practice is you know, treat your fundraisers like your vendors. They report to you. Um, in situations where the fundraiser comes up with the script, uh, you know, really controls the messaging and, and the marketing and then simply slides a one-page uh, script approval form under the nose of the executive director and you know, it's kind of like rubber stamped and signed. Um, I mean, I've heard regulators say, yeah, I've seen a million of those. We don't care. You know, we want to know what's really going on here. Um, several of these bullets all go to the point of transparency. Um, clear and conspicuous identification of the professional fundraising company. This is, this is a requirement under federal law, the telemarketing sales rule, um, and every state law. And some states go further than just identifying that you're a professional fundraiser. Minnesota, for example, requires you to identify uh, the city and state of the charity that you're representing if you're a fundraiser uh, and a, state, a statement about the tax deductibility of the donation. Um, most states don't go quite that far, but, um, but you know, being transparent in terms of who's calling, from where are you calling? Regulators take the view that a donor is much more likely to give if they think that their money is being used locally. And so implying that when it's not quite true um, or being, being misleading about it, uh, ghosting a phone number so that a local number comes up on the caller ID. Um, I actually don't think that's technically unlawful, but it is frowned upon. Um, and, and Jeff made an excellent point, um, misleading uh, in terms of the impact of your donation. Look, charities can pay fundraisers. We all know that. Uh, charitable solicitation is protected speech, even when it's done by a for-profit fundraiser your fundraiser does not have to voluntarily disclose the percentage of the donation that they're taking, although if they are asked, they should answer truthfully. But if the fundraiser is taking 80% of the donation, or I would say more than 50% of the donation, and the script says your dollar goes a long way toward XYZ, whatever the charitable program, regulators are going to look askance at that. So that, that's a great, you know, a, a great example of not lying, but being misleading. And then it, probably an important, it's a good time to make a couple corollary points about professional fundraising fees. We're focused here today on kind of the, the consumer protection side of, of this and the state regulatory side. Um, but there are other implications as well. There's a pretty famous case now uh, called the United Cancer Council case. It was a case uh, that the IRS brought against the 501c3 C3 charitable organization. It first brought a case against uh, the organization claiming impermissible uh, private inurement uh, due to the fact that the outside professional fundraiser was keeping 85 cents of every dollar that was raised for the organization. Um, the IRS actually lost that battle because the fundraiser was not considered an insider, a disqualified person for purposes of the IRS private inurement test. But then the IRS asserted a claim of impermissible private benefit, which is a much broader claim uh, that where you don't have to have an insider or disqualified person in order to trigger private benefit and the court agreed and found that there was impermissible private benefit and that too much benefit to the fundraiser, not enough to the general public and the charity, the organization ended up losing its tax exempt status. So there are issues there um, and then kind of related to that and dealing with a case right now for a client where the fees paid to the outside professional fundraisers 
are very, very high, and we're engaging um, uh, an outside valuation uh, firm to do a valuation of those fees to try to determine and ensure that they're at or below fair market value. A last point to make, uh, the leading professional society in the fundraising professional field is called the Association of Fundraising Professionals. Professionals, While they're, at a, uh, I forget exactly what it's called, but essentially the code of ethics uh, discourages uh, or even prohibits um, paying outside fundraisers as a percentage of what's paid, we all know that that's still very much uh, a common practice. Um, I don't want to characterize how common, but it is a very common practice in the charitable world. It is not illegal under IRS rules or state charity regulator rules, but as we're just talking about here, there are a lot of other, other things that go along with it that you should take into account. Yeah, question? Yeah, a question here. Um, I worked at a large charity, not for profit, and the fees were about, for fundraising, uh, outside fundraising, about 40 to 50 percent. What's a threshold or a red flag that you've seen that would call attention to a charity? Yeah, I mean, there, there is no hard and fast, you know, black and white test. Um, even in the uh, IRS, you know, what would be impermissible private benefit, the percentage alone is not going to dictate it, although we can pretty much say if it's 85 percent, it's probably not going to fly. If it's 40 or 50 percent, it's hard to say because there are other factors that have to be taken into account. I mean, if the charity was, say, on its dying last legs financially and was destitute and someone came along and is going to invest a huge amount in going out to do some fundraising and then it's going to share, you know, the proceeds 50-50, that might be a very different analysis than a very well-heeled charity that's been around for a long time and just decides it's going to pay its outside fundraiser 50 percent. You know, unfortunately, in terms of IRS rules, there, is, there are no black and white lines in this area. Um, and certainly not at the state level either. This is Anita. I just wanted to emphasize that state law vary drastically about what you have to articulate in the contract. So when you have nationwide contracts, those percentage questions do come into play because different states allow different formulas. So you really have to understand that when you're negotiating a nationwide. And as to the question of a percentage threshold, there should be a rational basis if you're making something that's extraordinary. Um, for instance, if you're trying to crack into a new um, constituency market that you've never done before and you're hiring a firm and it's very innovative and you don't know whether you're going to get traction, that's the kinds of things that you want to do. You want to document what's the analysis of why this firm brought some special skill that, and it may be something where this is a, it's a sustaining program. So the first dollar, the first month, it always looks absurd compared to how much it costs, but you expect a lifetime of, say, three years on this gift. So you have to document internally what the rationalization is. Hi, it's Eric. I'm just going to pile on. Um, I think the ratings agencies like Charity Navigator, Wise Given, I, I think they like to see 35% or less, but as Jeff correctly noted, it's not the law. And there's also more of a trend these days to acknowledge that it costs money to make money and stop chasing these artificially low uh, overhead fees. Um, look, you know, a fundraiser you know, has a, you know, it could have a call center. It lays out a lot of overhead. It takes all the risk. So you know, it's, it's not don't don't be ashamed of taking a high percentage. I think what a lot of people miss is it's not the numbers, but what are the incentives? If you take a percentage um, and and you also bonus up your sales representatives uh, on a weekly basis, what you know are you incentivizing them to maybe go rogue, go off script? Make, make aggressive claims. The other thing, I, I, I know the FTC feels this way, I think the states do. Um, Anita raised multi-year contracts. Regulators' assumption is that over time it's going to be more efficient to raise your dollars and acquire donors. So maybe you can start out at 80%, but that percentage should be going down over time. And if it's 80% if it's 80 locked in for 10 years, that's problematic. I'm going to, uh, just in the interest of time. And Eric, one, one quick point on that, which, which is a great one, and we've seen this a lot, where you do have, and it's just another thing you've got to keep an eye on when you have uh, percentage-based outside fundraisers. We have seen very much there is an incentive for the folks on the front line when, when they are being compensated based on what they bring in to push the legal envelope. We see this all the time in the credit counseling stuff that I was deeply involved in for years. We, I mean, I literally interviewed people who, and we listened to calls and they were way over the they, – they were not even following the, the guidance that was given to them by their supervisors because they knew what it was going to take to get people to sign up for these programs, and, and then they would make more money. 
And I've even seen it now with some of these big professional fundraising firms that, that well, I'm, I'm representing the charity and we're working on new uh, contracts for sponsorships or cause marketing or other things. And the outside firms are pushing us and pushing the staff to push the envelope on what they can say because they know it's going to generate more money if they can do that. And Titi is smiling because she works with me on some of these. And, it's, and, and these are, you know, Great, well uh, great, well run, well meaning charities, you know, great top notch professional fundraising firms, but they do have an incentive and a tendency, especially when they're getting paid as a percentage of what's raised, to push that regulatory envelope, even push back on the lawyers. So you really need to be on top of that and pay even more attention to what's going on. Do your due diligence and monitoring of the people on the front lines. If it's if it's just telephone solicitations, you know, for any other written solicitations, make sure that you're reviewing everything that goes out on a regular basis. We'll talk a little bit uh, later about monitoring and due diligence, but it's critical in this area. Absolutely. And so in the interest of time, we'll just um, skip a few slides ahead to, to trends and data, uh, which Atitia will take the lead on. Okay. So over time, we're seeing more and more collaboration among the state regulators, and um, there's increasing data that's becoming publicly available through multiple platforms. Um, technology is making it a lot easier to share data um, between regulators and for um, uh, service providers to um, collect data from publicly filed um, documents such as your form um, IRS Form 990 and make that information available to um, donors who are interested in doing some research on charities before making donations. So just historically, as, um, as Eric mentioned, NAG-NASCO, um, the National Association of, Deter of Attorneys General and the National Association of State Charity Officials meet annually. Um, and this is an opportunity for them to um, share um, enforcement trends and priorities, things that they're seeing, um, things that they're going to be focusing on in the coming years. Um, the charity officials uh, back in 2001 came together and developed what's called the Charleston Principles, which um, provides guidance on Internet solicitations. Virtually every charity out there these days has a Donate Now button on their website. So does that trigger registration? And that's what the Charleston principles provide guidance on. Um, regulators have also created what's called the Unified Registration Statement. This was their attempt to streamline the registration process. Um, in some ways it makes it a little easier, but it's not quite unified because every state still has you know, supplements that they want you to file or different documents they want you to attach. Um, so it was an effort to help the process, um, but they have a new effort which will hopefully come to fruition soon. Um, NAGNASCO has come together and uh, developed the Single Portal Initiative, which will bring the registration and filing um, requirements online. Um, it's a new platform that's being developed um, and will hopefully make the registration and annual filing process easier for both charities and professional fundraisers. And not only is it supposed to aid with the registration process, but um, and it's not only accessible by regulators and charities and professional fundraisers. Anyone in the public is supposed to be able to um, connect to the portal and look at information that has been filed by charities and professional fundraisers. Um, so if you want to do some data crunching, again, do some research on um, charities that you're looking to donate to, or if you're a corporation and want to partner with a charity, this information is going to be available in one platform. Right now there are 13 pilot states um, participating in the development of the single portal, um, and the hope is that down the road, um, all states that require registration um, will participate in the portal and make the process easy for everyone, um, reducing administrative costs, increasing transparency. As Eric mentioned, um, many state regulators publish annual reports. They take information from um, the registration filings and um, publish these reports that kind of detail different 
types of um, methods of solicitation that are being used, um, gross receipts that are coming in, um, net amount to charity, and they'll calculate the percentages. So if you're a charity um, looking to hire a professional fundraiser, this is a resource. You can see you know, what professional fundraisers are charging. Um, Massachusetts and Michigan are examples of states that publish these reports online. If you go to their um, AG website, you can just download a copy of the report and see um, the trends in terms of solicitation methods being used and um, percentages to the charities and professional fundraisers. So as I mentioned, Data is becoming more and more available. Um, earlier this year, the IRS announced the public availability of machine-readable um, Form 990s from 2011 to present. So this platform is being run by Amazon Web Services, and basically um, you can go online, anyone can go online, a regulator, federal, state regulator, um, donors, journalists, academics, um, you can go online and just search for information on or look at 990s that have been filed by charities. And this enables people to compare um, and scrutinize disclosures and financials across different charities. We've talked about charity rating systems, but Anita, do you want to talk about Charity Navigator? Um, you, uh, many of you are familiar with the charity rating agencies, but even this month, uh, the Charity Navigator announced a new enhanced version of their advisory system. And what's really important to know is that they have definitions, but if you go and look very closely, you'll find that what they've posted is many times driven by a media report. And I don't mean the New York Times or Tampa Bay. I am talking about small town newspaper that someone is upset um, that something happened and it's a headline and all of a sudden it's located in the moderate. And I'm not being critical of that, uh, that disclosure so much as identifying that you as charities want to make a really strong effort to sign up for all of the like watch lists. I know GuideStar has, Charity Navigator has something similar. So you can find out what's being said about your organization that you may not know and is now going up. It's very important that you are your own advocate in this area. This may be a very unfounded claim, something that um, takes a broad brush statement um, without any details. So I cannot say enough how important it is because as donors and as media look for other media's uh, uh, reporting, it's going to create opportunities for information that may not be as accurate about an organization. So I, it's important to know that this uh, industry is robust and growing. And in fact, <clears throat> I think it's more robust than ever before. <clears throat> Charity Navigator in particular has perhaps been the most aggressive at um, either putting the charities on their, on their advisories and, and watch lists or threatening to do so. We've had uh, a number of clients of ours uh, who have received letters from Charity Navigator saying we've received the following information. 99% of the time it was from media reports. Um, and we're, we're considering you know, putting, uh, putting out this uh, advisory watch list, I forget what it's been called in the past, um, and they'll give you, they'll, they'll usually say we'll give you three days or 48 hours to respond. Um, I can tell you in each and every instance um, there was something there, but it was, it was uh, perceived to be in, in a much more negative light than the reality was. And once we were able to push back by a little time, put together a, a fulsome response that explained the issue in great detail and with some aggressiveness, frankly, that's important, um, and even sometimes some threats if necessary, in every single case we were successful in getting them to back down. But we're seeing this more and more, and it's incredibly dangerous for your organization. Sometimes this is more dangerous than a government investigation. You, you, get, you get put on one of these things, donors, grantors, private foundations, governments, all, they, they, will, they will start to back away from you. Even you know, long-standing, well-run, uh, great reputation organizations, it can happen. And so Anita's right. You need to be aggressive in staying on top of this stuff, in battling these these, these uh, agencies, they're, they're, they're well-intentioned as well, don't get me wrong, and they have their, their best intentions at heart. But what we found is that maybe because of limited resources or, or otherwise, they don't have 
the ability to really dive into things. And so they see something on the surface and they just run with it. Um, and it's up to you to push back on that. One thing to add to that is, you know, be aware of what these charity ratings are actually rating against. So for example, you could have a gold star on GuideStar, but that's not based on the information that is provided in your Form 990. It's based on how much information you provide. Um, so just be careful um, when you're comparing or looking at different ratings agencies. And Atitia, I mean, we've heard from a lot of our clients that kind of some of these new rating systems, they're, how do I put it? You can rig the system. I mean, if you know what they're looking for and the kind of data and the way it's presented and the way it's categorized, you can get yourself a better rating by presenting it. In, you know, it's like anything else. If you know what they're going to evaluate, you give it to them in a way that they're going to evaluate it more favorably, and you can get better results. And frankly, you have nothing to lose by doing that. Absolutely. Okay. Um, Cause IQ and CitizenAudit.org, these are just examples of platforms that are available out there and um, to the public if, they wanna, if people want to do more research on charities before giving or partnering with um, an organization. Um, CitizenAudit.org, the um, founder was actually at the most recent NAGNASCO conference and did a presentation um, on his platform, and it was really neat. So what the platform does is you can run keyword searches um, on a nonprofit organization, and it develops a, an in-depth profile based on information pulled from 990s from, that have been filed over the past 15 years. And then another interesting feature though is um, data mapping. It has data mapping capabilities. So you can visually see the connections between a corporation or a nonprofit organization's um, board members, officers, and key employees, uh, contractors. You can see where the money is coming in from and who the money is going out to. So it's a neat visualization tool. And of course, it, it makes those issues we talked about earlier, like related party transactions, potential conflicts of interest amongst board members, family relations, all of those things, now much more relevant. Because in the past, you, know, you, you just put a name of an organization on a form, a list of the officers and directors, and no one would really know who they are. Uh, but now with this, this kind of research, this sort of publicly available information that's available to the regulators, state AG's offices, IRS, FTC, and anyone else, along with donors, grantors, etc., it becomes now even more important to really focus on the makeup of your board, your officers, and making sure you're staying attuned to these risks. I think this is a good segue into the fact that there are trends in state law particularly to pay attention to. Um, you know, you really don't want them to call you out. And these, these data sets feed into information about um, the very things that state laws are starting to change. They're spending a lot more time on conflict of interest. The conflict of interest provisions um, can be found in these nuanced places in, the, in your filings with each state. What's interesting about that is, is that you answer some of the same questions in different forms to the IRS. And you have to read very carefully because they're not all the same question. They have different financial thresholds. Sometimes they have no threshold at all. And so if you do not have a party within your organization, for instance, looking at that answer across the board to make sure it is substantiated and you know why you answered that the way that you did, um, there are a lot of new data resources coming out to find out exactly who your board members are, what ownership they have in companies. They're really mining data. Um, and that data is now available. And when you combine that with the fact that the goal is, is that your state filings will be on all one platform and also very um, easy to manipulate to compare and contrast your answers, you want to make sure you have systems in place. Directors are becoming more personally liable. Uh, this year in California, le uh, legislation, sorry, regulations went into effect that um, pretty easily triggers um, director liability and, and pivots away from the organization for um, missteps. Um, some of the paperwork requirements alone can trigger extraordinary implications for your organization. 
such as we mentioned earlier, an incomplete financial form. Um, a TG is right. They're glad to talk to you, but in the meantime, you will not be soliciting donations in their state. And um, they are now getting much more interested in sending notices to your board members. Now, you may say, well, my board members, all that would come to us directly. They're using other resources to identify how to contact individuals who are serving on boards. Um, and that's the last thing that any of you really want to do is get a call from your board member asking when they receive this notice. But it happens, and you're a good charity. So having strong systems in place. Um, there's a lot higher expectations for audit oversight. Um, you obviously saw that in the New York law, which was changed a couple of years ago. But I would say they're also expecting that, it, that you are auditing your um, transactions with professional fundraisers. Do you really know how they came up with the numbers that they came up with uh, that said the money they raised? Um, do you have comparable books? I, this is the kind of thing that you want to make sure if you're engaging third parties to do things for you. But it goes below the state level. Property tax exemption um, for those that own property in states is becoming um, much more at risk or a higher threshold to obtain it. Um, if you let your charity status um, lapse, then you can lose your property tax exemption in some states. Uh, there's also a localized interest in charity rules, for, and I already mentioned that for fundraising. Uh, there's also like the state of Oregon now has triggers for imposing state income tax if you have not kept your charity registration current. So they are thinking of many ways to penalize charities that go well beyond someone quote losing their status as a charity. Yeah, and just to be sure we're all on the same page, what Anita is talking about, we're not even talking about your 501c3 tax exempt status. That's obviously critical, and if you lose that, it's usually game over for most nonprofit organizations. We're talking about all of the different rules that come into play at the state and even sometimes at the local level, and not just the charitable solicitation registration. We get clients all the time who get confused and they say, yeah, I'm, re I'm already registered in this state. And, and, but what they really mean is they're registered, they're qualified to do business as a foreign corporation. So whatever state you're incorporated in, if you have offices or even employees, in other states, you are obligated to qualify to do business as a foreign corporation. Beyond that, though, in order to uh, be able to, to, to do a state charitable solicitation registration, which is something different, oftentimes you first have to be qualified to do business as a foreign corporation in that state. And so there is all these multiple requirements of state registration, and sometimes it even extends down to the local level, that you really need to be sure that you, what you think is done was done. Um, because even something, I mean, we saw it with the Trump Foundation, something as simple as a state charity registration, it just wasn't done, and it turned out to be a, a huge issue. And obviously, that's a very high-profile organization. But with your own organizations, whether you're high-profile or not, you really want to drill down and make sure that you have all of these corporate registrations. You, you're maintaining your corporate status in your own state, your foreign qualification to do business in other states, your state charitable solicitation. In a few states, we're going to talk about the require commercial co-venture registration, and sometimes other things as well. There's so many little things that are very nuanced and difficult to get your arms around. You really need to drill down. And Titi, do you want to say something? Yeah, just real quick. Um, you know, as Jeff mentioned, there are distinctions between foreign corporation registration versus charity registration, and you want to be aware of that because recently I had a client who said, oh yeah, we want to register nationwide to um, solicit charitable contributions, but you know, you're too expensive, so we're just going to do it on our own. Well, not too long afterwards they came back and it turned out that they had registered as a foreign corporation nationwide and spent all this money and time and effort registering for the wrong type of registration. So just be cautious, um, and then they came back and, you know, then asked for, you know, some guidance on how to prepare the correct types of registration. I told you to hire a TTIA. <laughs> so we really want you to have a home run on legal compliance, as you can tell. So let's first of all acknowledge the complexity, which is exactly to the point that my peers are talking about. Um, IRS is obviously top level, but state agencies, which we'll talk about a little some, and that'll probably be the bulk of what we finish this presentation on. Local government, the FTC we've talked about, um, consumer financial protections, uh, and various bureaus within the federal agencies. But let's talk about the IRS. 
I already mentioned earlier about your IRS form and that you need to be really cognizant of what you're saying on it and is it consistent with what you're telling your state regulators. Many people overlook the fundraising schedule. The fundraising schedule is so critical that it's right. And making sure that the fundraising expenses actually have been arrived at with some you know, solid financial management. Um, many staff don't even realize, you know, I'm engaged in fundraising, now I may need to make sure that the time I'm spending on that is being uh, appropriately recorded because you're not engaged in direct mission-related activities, but you're doing fundraising. But professional fundraising expenses and revenue is probably one of those trickier areas where you need to find a way that you are aligning the direct expenses with that fundraising uh, contract along with the revenues, and that you know how you came up with the calculation and does it directly reflect the books that the fundraiser has kept as well. Um, fundraising event performance, also reportable. Cash. Um, and non-cash contributions. So I encourage you to look very carefully at Schedule G and also to assure that the staff who are doing fundraising understands how important it is that they do things in a consistent, accurate way in making those records and the financial staff are comfortable with the, with the numbers that they get. Because as we all know, this is the most public form of fundraising, and it is the easiest way to compare to the state filings that you'll make, which I'll turn to Atitia. So currently, um, for charities, there are 39 states that, and, and D.C. that require charities to register when conducting um, solicitations. So when, when exactly do you need to register? If we just have a Donate Now button on our website, is that enough to trigger registration? And I always tell clients, okay, let's figure out what your fundraising activities will be and where will you be, where will you be um, soliciting contributions. Because it's not just where you're incorporated, um, or where you have your principal place of business, that's not the trigger for registration. These charitable solicitation laws exist to protect citizens. So if you are reaching out to um, persons in Massachusetts, California, wherever, um, the laws protect the citizens of those states. Atiti, do we have a question from the webinar. Maybe you could speak to a second about kind of solicitations where you just have a passive kind of donate now button on your website for anyone who may choose to, to to, uh, to, to donate to you online in that way versus um, a, a directed, proactive email uh, solicitation campaign directed at citizens of, say, all, all, all 50 states plus D.C. You want to talk about kind of registration obligations under the Charleston Principles for a second? Sure. So um, a while back I had mentioned the Charleston Principles, which were developed by, the, uh, by NASCO to provide guidelines on Internet so solicitations. So, the easy piece here is you know, if you're calling into states, if you're sending mailers into states, if you have fundraising events in a particular state, um, in some cases organizations don't realize that if you're sending um, grant proposals to foundations, for example, that's considered a solicitation um, requiring registration. If you, have just, if you just have a Donate Now button on your website and nothing more, that likely is not going to trigger registration because that's not – um, if you don't, if your offline activities would trigger registration in addition to having this Donate Now button on your website, then the Charleston principal say you need to register or you should register. Um, if you are domiciled in a state, if you have a principal place of business in a state and you are conducting fundraising activities through your website from that state, so for example, um, the Rock Foundation is incorporated in Virginia, and um, I have a Donate Now button on my website. I should register in Virginia because I'm undertaking solicitation activities from Virginia. Um, but what if you're so then you're Virginia domiciled nonprofit corporation? Um, what if you decide you're going to start? I think. What you were trying to say, I think, is that if you're doing phone solicitations, you know, mail, direct mail solicitations, in person, on the ground, you know, fundraising event solicitations in any state, that's going to trigger um, registration in those states, even if you're not located in those states. But the email solicitations that you might send and direct specifically send to people in other states, 
how does that – say you were doing no other form of solicitation, right. would that trigger an obligation? Sure. So if you are targeting citizens of a particular state, um, then that would trigger registration obligations. Um, if you are receiving substantial or um, uh, repeated and ongoing uh, contributions from certain states, then that would trigger registration requirements. See, that's, it's kind of backwards looking for that last test um, because you know we could start um, a donate now button on our website and not know where money will be coming in from. So um, you need to look at the data from the past year um, to see you know how much contributions you're receiving. If you know you're receiving a substantial amount from persons from a specific state, then that would then trigger registration requirements in that state. Right. So the bottom line is if you're directing solicitations to a state or if you receive repeated and substantial contributions from residents of a state, then it's going to be triggered. And of course, if you're a 501c3 charity that does traditional types of fundraising, you're almost only going to need to do nationwide registration. Right. So there are some exemptions to registration. There aren't very many, but and every state is different. But some of the more common exemptions you see out there are um, if you don't expect to raise $25,000 or more in a calendar year, then you're exempt from registration. If you are an educational institution or a religious organization, you're exempt from, generally exempt from registration. So there are exemptions out there. So if you are required to register, what does that mean? Um, I mentioned that uh, we have this unified registration statement because the regulators were trying to streamline the registration process. Right now, every state has its own registration form. And as you can imagine, it's an administrative nightmare trying to complete these filings, you know, attach the correct documents. Many of these require um, submitting a copy of your Articles of Incorporation, bylaws, your IRS determination letter, and it's not uniform across all states, so it can be a little bit of a headache um, trying to put everything together if you're registering nationwide. Um, but it is doable, and hopefully with the single portal initiative, it will make everyone's lives easier. Um, once you register, you also have to renew annually. So it's not register once and then you're allowed to solicit for years on end. Um, reg uh, regulators want to be able to oversee and make sure that you know, you're – see where the money is coming in from and making sure that you're spending your money towards your program services. So once you register, there are disclosures that need to be made when soliciting. Um, there are annual financial reports that need to be submitted each year. This is usually filing a copy of your Form 990. Um, and if your revenues are high enough, if they meet a certain threshold, usually around $500,000 or a million dollars, you need to submit a copy of your audited financial statements as well. So a lot of information going to the state regulators in order to um, legally be able to solicit donations. And as part of the registration requirement, um, one of the questions in almost every single um, registration is you are required to disclose relationships with professional fundraisers, fundraising consultants, or commercial co-ventures. So they can – state regulators can look at your registration and make sure that you know, the fundraising counterpart is also properly registered. This is just an example of a, a disclosure that must be included on um, written solicitations. In Florida, the, the solicitation disclosure is required to be included on your website. So if you have a Donate Now button on your website, technically this um, disclosure should, be, should appear on your website. So fundraising professionals, there are – two types. Um, the first is a professional solicitor. This is anyone who is paid to go out and solicit money for your um, organization, or they're paid to have custody and control of funds solicited. Um, the other type of fundraising professional is a fundraising consultant. These people are paid to basically do all the behind the scenes work. They do everything leading up to making the ask for the organization. So they're helping advising on strategic um, development issues, you know, advising on how to target donors, um, helping to design your mailers, um, that sort of thing. 
some questions that I frequently get from clients or prospective clients on whether um, you know, someone they're looking to engage is a fundraising professional required to register. Um, one is, if our employees solicit, are they then considered a professional solicitor and do they need to be registered? And the answer there is generally no. Most state definitions expressly exclude bona fide employees from the definition of a professional solicitor. So, um, for example, your chief development officer is not required to register. Or if you, your organization has a fundraising department that you know, has five staff members who are working on your fundraising efforts, those folks are excluded from the definition of professional solicitor or a fundraising consultant and do not need to register. So as I mentioned, there are registration requirements and registration for professional, for fundraising professionals are much more onerous than for charities. Um, states are skeptical of people who are raising money for uh, charities. And so in some cases, for example, New York, um, Kentucky, and Florida, they require fingerprinting of fundraising professionals or background checks. So just know that these requirements are out there as part of the registration process. Many states also require bonds be filed with your um, uh, fundraising professional registration, and especially if you are a professional solicitor who, have, who will have custody and control of funds. State statutes also have um, contract filing requirements. So when you, a charity, hires a fundraising professional, we've talked about you know, the importance of having a good contract that spells out the terms, you know, making sure that you're, you're clearly um, addressing like, what the professional fundraiser is supposed to do for you. Um, and there are also mandatory um, contract provisions that need to be in the contract. In addition to the contract, we have disclosure requirements. As Eric mentioned, you know, when you call as a fundraising professional calling on behalf of a charity, making sure you say, hi, um, you know, I'm calling on behalf of the charity as a paid solicitor. Each state has very specific disclosure requirements, and so again, it varies on a state-by-state -state basis. And then there are regular reports. Um, once a solicitation campaign ends, the fundraising professional is required to file a campaign financial report so that regulators can see how much money the fundraiser has raised for the organization, how much money is actually going to the charity versus how much is going to the fundraising professional. I mentioned um, mandatory contract provisions. This is just a listing of some of the required, the commonly required contract provisions you'll see. And one quick point here, you might be thinking, okay, this is, this is nice, but I'm not a professional fundraiser. I just work for a charity. So these are all obligations on them. You know, let the fundraiser take care of this. And even if your contract says you know, that the uh, fundraiser is uh, representing and warranting that they're, they're going to comply with all applicable federal, state, and local laws, that's not enough. First off, some of these obligations are on you. Like you have to make sure certain provisions are, provisions are in the contract. But like I alluded to earlier, if the fundraiser is not complying with all of its obligations, while it may not technically legally come back on you and to bite you in terms of fines or penalties, it very well may come back to bite you in terms of drawing unwanted attention from regulators, certainly drawing media attention, uh, certainly potentially drawing donor and grantor and, and others' attention. And so it's really important that you not only make sure you know, up front through your due diligence, through the contracting process that the fundraiser is going to comply with all these obligations, but you need to follow up on an ongoing basis and ask and verify and make sure that this stuff is being done because it very much can affect you as well. You have a question right here? Yeah. Uh, just Wait one sec for the mic. My question is, um, where does, if you have someone who uh, helps you and you're in one of the jurisdictions that doesn't require the person to register, but you're fundraising in other jurisdictions with their assistance that would require, if they were there, to, to be registered, do the fact that you're fundraising in those jurisdictions trigger their registration requirements? or are they only um, have to register in places where they are physically located? It's about who, who are the consumers that are being 
solicited. So in that case, if even though you, your staff are not, if you're asking that fundraiser to reach into that state, you are now subject to that state's laws, which means those registrations do need to be evaluated under those laws, not the law where you are soliciting. But it, the two different registrations, A, we're talking about the charitable, the charity registration, but then I think you're talking about the professional fundraiser. If, the, if it's a professional solicitor, professional fundraiser, not the consultant, that's a different analysis, but the fundraiser, if that fundraiser is attempting to solicit fun, or is soliciting funds in a particular state, then yes, it is going to have to register. If it is not soliciting funds in that state, but happens to be working with your charity to solicit funds in another state, then it should not have to register in that. So there's no kind of vicarious registration obligation just because they're working with your charity. Okay. We'll talk about commercial co-ventures real quick because I know we're running out of time. But um, you see lots of promotions out there these days on the, on commercial, in commercials, radio. You, know, you go into a retail store and you see a sign buy this product and a portion of the sales will be donated to um, XYZ uh, charity. This is called a charitable sales promotion and the commercial entity that is conducting that promotion is called a commercial co-venture, a CCV. And just like charities and fundraising professionals, they also have um, registration and re financial reporting requirements, um, mandatory contract provisions, um, and disclosures that uh, need to be in all marketing and advertising copy um, so as not to mislead consumers as to what their purchase of a product actually means. Um, so this, this uh, slide lists the registration and notification obligations for the CCV versus the charity. Um, and it, you know, I've had clients come to me saying, we want to do this promotion, whether it's a for-profit or um, charity. Usually if, if it's the commercial entity, they say, oh, but we have to undertake you know, this nationwide registration if we want to conduct this charitable sales promotion. And they are quickly relieved to find out that you know, there are only a small handful of states that actually have registration um, requirements, and it's not as burdensome as you might think, even if you want to run this campaign nationwide. Just, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, we, you know, we talked about the FTC a lot. I'll, two concluding points. Substantiation. If, if you were to read any of the complaints that the FTC has filed against uh, charity fundraisers, you would see an allegation that the fundraiser failed to ascertain the truth of the claims that it was making. So what I typically recommend to fundraiser clients is roughly every six months, if you can do it, engage in some, some substantiation. Send a worksheet to your charity clients uh, you know, asking them to fill in descriptions of their programs, update anything, verify that the scripts are true, uh, disclose how much money goes to which program. And if you're the charity, uh, you know, I mean, sometimes that gets a little awkward, but don't be offended by that or, or, or be defensive about it. Um, it. It's for your own good. And where does six months come from? You know, uh, running theme today. It's not a legal requirement. There's no law. Uh, there are consent decrees that require it uh, every six months. There was, there was a big case where the FTC joined with about 30, 35 states uh, six or seven years ago, and that's you know that's where six months came from. And like we said, we look to these consent decrees for guidance. Um, so that's number one. Number two, material relationships. I meant to I meant to say this earlier, um, and and you look to the for-profit space. You, you I'm sure you've heard of social media influencers, right? These people who tweet about the hot new restaurant down the street, or they post a picture to Instagram with their new pair of shoes, and they appear to be regular people, but it turns out that the shoe company paid them or the restaurant gave them a free meal, right? So they were given something of material value to, to, uh, to sort of endorse something. And the FTC, it's new, but the FTC is all over it. The Washington Post just wrote an article about this. It's becoming a mini economy. And the regulators want to see disclosures, even if it's just hashtag ad or hashtag endorses a lot of letters, but you know something like that, uh, hashtag sponsor. That is a best practice that uh, those of us at this table tend to transfer from the for-profit sector to, to the nonprofit. Um, disclosure, disclosure, disclosure. 
I've counseled trade associations on this. Uh, you've got your annual meeting come up, uh, coming up. You want to drum up some interest. You have a photo contest. Um, you know, submit your best photo. You win a prize at the annual meeting. Uh, your Twitter sphere ought to know that you are a member of the association that's running this contest, that sort of thing. Um, anyway, just two quick points on yeah, and, and, and I think the takeaway from this, so the, the, the FTC has this guidance on, uh, on endorsements and, um, and, and uh, what's that other word that we call it? Uh, uh, testimonials. And the endorsements and testimonials. Um, uh, there is guidance that we included in your handout materials uh, that the New York Attorney General Charities Bureau put out about basically cause marketing. It was focused on the breast cancer charity area, but it really applies to any kind of charitable cause marketing. Um, other FTC guidance that Eric's pulled from consent decrees. All of this stuff, while it may not be black and white letter of the law, this is the kind of guidance that particularly the state attorneys general and the state charity regulators are going to look to when analyzing your behavior. Um, and so that's why while it may not be directly, uh, literally applicable to your organization, it's not only a best practice, but it's the legal standard that the states are going to follow. The presentation has within it uh, some solicitation hazards to avoid, many of which we've talked about. So we're going to go right to, I'm going to bring up the FTC one more time. FTC is looking at crowdfunding, which follows right into the conversation we've just had that you know, a lot of uh, third parties are out there using your brand and, and, uh, and sometimes with or without permission uh, look very closely. Um, that crowdfunding activity can be very much not charitable fundraising, but it puts you smack dab in the middle if you're not controlling your brand. So we do want you to come home safe. We do want you to get that home run. So some of the basics of compliance is that you have internally a consistent and accurate system of tracking all your fundraising expenses and revenue, that there is tone at the top about this being a serious matter. One thing that TTA didn't mention but it's in the slides is that it is a requirement in fundraising contracts that, the, that in some states that a board member signs. Um, that is where the states are looking. What is the board of directors doing to control these, um, these parties acting on behalf of the organization? Training and education staff on basic compliance. Um, standardized contracts are, take very seriously the reflection of the law, the audit requirements, and having exit terms. So you as a charity or as a fundraising contractor, whether it be either, can get out. Um, so, and to take very seriously the audit and follow-up, that you are really monitoring where the money is coming from, where it's going. And as to your, if you're a charity, I'm sorry, if you're a fundraising professional, you want to speak to that at all? I know we're running out of time. You really want to evaluate your charity. Um, I know that Eric already made reference to that. You want to confirm the state um, that the charity is actually registered to do the fundraising. You want to have a system for monitoring the uh, scripts. And let me just say something about subcontractors. The subcontractors to professional fundraisers get everybody in trouble. Um, there are many places where they actually have to register as a fundraiser as well. Make sure there are controls over the subcontractors. Yeah, subcontractors get lots of the nonprofit at the top contracting with one party and then the subcontractors. I can't tell you how many cases that we've had to extract our clients out of really messy situations because of the behavior of the subcontractors. And in almost every one of those instances, it's because there wasn't careful due diligence and vetting at the outset. There wasn't a lot of uh, you know, flow down rules being imposed on the subs and there wasn't ongoing monitoring and verification and that's critically important. Petitia? And Registrations for fundraising professionals require you to disclose whether you're subcontracting any of your work out. So that's also something to keep in mind. You have to disclose names and addresses and telephone numbers of those subcontractors. And, and finally, while it's not directly addressed by a lot of this, to the extent that you're using volunteers to engage in fundraising, you have to keep in mind that while they may not be getting paid, so they're not going to trigger prof prof professional fundraiser registration, you still have to deal with a lot of these same issues about deceptive marketing, misleading marketing statements that are being made, and you want to have them train them in the same way that you're training your paid contractors to be able to follow these rules. So we'd like you to have some sunny days like Chicago did recently and have a very successful relationship with your professional fundraisers and your own fundraisers in-house. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Hope to see you back here next month.